I was going to look at this. So, so this is the one you want to look at if you have an eye contact. So that's wide angle, right? This right. is the one I'm going to follow. I'm going to be, I'm going yeah. to be speaking to people. That's right, directly at this camera. Good morning, friends. We welcome you to this live stream special broadcast. For those of you who are maybe joining us outside of Victoria, I want to welcome you. The last time we had viewers all the way from Alberta and other parts of Canada and even outside of Canada. So we welcome you to this telecast, a very special telecast. I believe, I honestly believe that today's broadcast is going to change your life. I really would like to encourage you to stay with us for the remainder of this uh, live stream on the, our YouTube channel and we will try our best to bring these live services to you every single Saturday at 12 o'clock. We have uh, some special messages this morning for us from our church leadership in Canada but before they speak I just like to remind uh, uh, the people to join us uh, every Wednesday at 7 o'clock uh, on this virtual prayer meeting and there you have the address of the zoom.us uh, US and there is the ID password that you can see there on the screen so all you have to do is just click on this link and you will be able to join us I believe more than ever we as a community have to pray for the safety and for the health of our families our cities our countries we want to, we want to ask you to join us every Wednesday and then uh, every Saturday morning uh, at 10 o'clock there's going to be a joint Sabbath school lesson with Rest Haven and Victoria Church. I understand that this morning we had a little glitch because uh, suddenly Zoom created uh, a new ID for us. We apologize for that. Perhaps uh, in the future we're just gonna double check to make sure that Zoom uh, still uh, gives us the same ID uh, like from previous weeks. But uh, starting uh, next Saturday, hopefully we'll not have any glitches, but Rest Haven and Victoria are inviting you to join us um, on this uh, Sabbath school lesson. I understand we heard many positive feedback from, from people saying they really enjoyed the interaction, even though we all of us are staying home, but this is probably the only venue for us to communicate and to connect. So we wanna uh, invite you to join us. And then the uh, coronavirus, as I mentioned today, I'm gonna repeat it once again, I believe this program will change your life and uh, before we continue I just want to say that we have a special message from Pastor Mark Johnson he's the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada he has a, a, a message for us let us give our attention to him dear Adventist family throughout Canada during this time greatly engrossed by the news of the coronavirus be at peace. The same Jesus who calmed the winds and the waves cares for you and those dear to you. As a church, we will continue to follow the guidelines outlined by public health officials and government leadership. We encourage our membership to consult their local conferences for specific information within your region. And while we take our precautions, I charge you to remember who we are. Seventh-day Adventist Church in Canada, we are the church that loves the Lord and does for others what we would want done for ourselves. We are the church that amidst the panic purchasing sees the single mother living paycheck to paycheck stressed over how she will provide for her family during this crisis and we offer our blessings of time and money to assure her troubled heart we are the church that seeks the elderly and vulnerable and ensures that they are equipped with groceries and sanitation supplies because we desire to keep those at higher risk safe we are the church that supports church leaders as they develop plans to meet congregational needs and prepare churches with proper sanitation. We are the church that works 
together as a national congregation to provide peace amidst the storms of fear. We are the church that knows the call to love our neighbors never ceases. Fear not, my friends. Together, we will stay connected to Jesus in the light of the world so we can shine in every one of our communities. You know, here in Victoria, this is definitely the end of an era for us. I'm standing here in this church in Victoria, and officially this is the very final worship service at 983 Pandora. For many years we have been gathering here, and our church has been a vibrant place where kids and young families come. And as we uh, continue this telecast, we just cannot forget about our children who are watching this live broadcast right now. Dear kids, we just want you to know that we didn't forget about you. And in the middle of this uh, coronavirus outbreak, I know that all of you are at home, we have a very special story for you this morning. And the story is not just for you, but I believe it's also for adults. Because the story teaches us how not to be afraid so uh, please enjoy this wonderful three-minute story about how not to be afraid. Hello boys and girls, this is Anna Flamita and I have a wonderful story for you called Who Cares? Today's memory verse is from Psalms 56 verse 3. It says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. The message for today's story is when we are afraid, we can trust in God. Is there anything you are afraid of? Joseph was afraid, but he decided to trust in God. One day, Joseph's older brothers took the family's great flocks of sheep far away from home. The sheep had eaten all the grass in the nearby fields, so the brothers had to find new green fields where the sheep could eat. Many, many days passed, and the brothers had not returned. I want you to go find your brothers, Father Jacob said to Joseph. See if they need anything, then come back and tell me if they're all right. Yes, Father, I'll go at once, Joseph said. He packed some food for the long trip. Finally ready, he put on his beautiful coat and started out. He walked and walked and walked. It took several days to find his brothers. One morning, his brothers looked out across the field and saw Joseph coming towards them. Here comes that dreamer, one brother hissed. Why is he here? asked another. Then they talked about bad things that they could do to Joseph, and they made plans, terrible plans. Here you are, Joseph called, running up to his brothers but his smile slid right off his face as his brothers grabbed him roughly. At first, they pulled off Joseph's beautiful coat. Then they pushed him into a big hole in the ground, a hole so deep he couldn't climb out. The brothers returned to their campfire and sat down to eat. But Joseph's brother, Reuben, didn't feel right about what they had done. He secretly planned to pull Joseph out of the deep hole later and send him home. Reuben thought about it as he went to the fields to care for the sheep. While Reuben was gone, another brother named Judah looked out across the valley. Here come some traders, he exclaimed. Here's a way to get rid of that dreamer. Let's sell Joseph to them. He can be their slave. So that is what the brothers did. They sold Joseph to the traders for 20 pieces of silver. At first, Joseph was very frightened. He shivered and shook, and then he cried. Then he thought of his father and of the many stories Father Jacob had told to him about how God always cared for him. Joseph decided to trust God to take care of him too. He didn't understand why this bad thing was happening to him, but he trusted God to be with him wherever he went. You can trust God to be with you too. He will be with you wherever you go, whatever you do. He loves you and wants you to trust him. I hope 
kids that you enjoy this wonderful story and the story reminding us to trust in God. You know, friends, before our final presentation, and I would like to again encourage you to please stay with us because we have, uh, I believe we have an important message that will, will encourage you and um, will bring you peace in the middle, in the midst of this uh, uh, pandemic outbreak worldwide. But we also have a message, special message from our friend, and this is Pastor Wesley Torres, who is the president of British Columbia Conference, and he has a special message for the people all over British Columbia. So I would like us to dedicate for the next seven minutes. It's a message, and then there is a special stewardship video, a testimony of a young man. Um, I hope that you will be blessed as well by watching this video. Beloved members of the British Columbia Conference, before I introduce to you our stewardship video for this month, on behalf of our administrative team during the conference, I would like to thank you for your community, your love, passion, and education, and all that you do for the enhancement of God's cause in our conference. We are living in uncertain times, times of doubts. There is confusion out there, lots of questions. The coronavirus crisis has created all these situations and people don't know what to do. That should not be our case. We have God's word on our side. In His word, He has promised, Hebrews 13, 5, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And He has promised to give us His power and His love as well. 2 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. It's time for us to propagate and to encourage each other. As we propagate the message that God loves us and He cares about us, let's encourage one another. Let's pray for each other. Let's call each other. A phone call, a text message, a FaceTime. Using whichever channel of social media that you have the ability to, to bring people together as we depend on God because He is still in control. He has never lost control. We are engraved on the palms of His hands. He cares for us. He loves us. And above all, Jesus is coming soon. Let us get ready for His coming and show our faith and our dependence on His amazing free salvation already given to us, paid for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let's now join the testimony of Justin, a young man who has faced many challenges, but has decided to allow the Lord to use him for his honor and glory, using the talents that were bestowed upon him. I'm sure all of us will be blessed by Justin's testimony. God has blessed me in many ways. Probably one of the biggest ways God has blessed me is when I was first adopted, when I was almost six. Uh, I had been placed into foster care, but it was a Christian uh, foster care system, so it was almost like God was already planning out my life as a Christian beforehand, before I even got adopted. He knew that he wanted to use me as a servant to help spread his word and love to people who would need it later on. Um, so that was pretty much my first Christian experience within a household. Yeah, I still remember the day. It, I was scared at first, but then even when I was scared, my mom and God were there for me. And I started going to church, church more with my mom. As eventually time got by, um, I wanted to eventually then give my life to God. I eventually then started helping out with children's story. I started telling children's story because God had given me the uh, guest talent of being able to do really good public speaking. I thought, well, God gives us gifts to use them, so why not use the gift that God has given me? So I started telling stories, and I still remember after church of telling my first story, people from the church, even the pastor came up and actually congratulated me for telling such a good story. And so after the first one, they wanted me to do more. So I started doing more stories uh, every few months. And then my mom heard about the mission trip for Uganda. She thought 
for me, this would be the perfect chance to go to a different place for the first time without her, to spread the word of God. And I thought, okay, yeah, why not? Um, when we were there in Uganda, the first day was definitely rough and probably one of the hardest days I had because we were doing a lot more physical labor than the days to come. But <laughs> we were also slightly embarrassed on that day because as we're struggling to carry these one drugs up the hill, like there comes along like these like kids, maybe like 10, 7, something like that, and they'll carry these drugs basically barefoot just up where it passes as we're struggling to carry them. And it just shows that even these people, like, they don't have, they pretty much have nothing except for faith. And it's honestly incredible to see the faith that these people have. And that really inspired me uh, when I eventually got back because it's like, you see how little these people have. And they are so much more happier than we are. And we have everything we could want and yet we're not happy because we still want more. If you want to try something, don't be afraid to try it. Go and try helping out at your church or at homeless shelters. Don't be afraid to go and be helpful to others. Go on mission trips. Go help people who don't normally get help from other people. Go and volunteer with Adra. Help out with, in places that you may never even think about going to. Go and be helpful to everyone you can have a chance of meeting. I pray that all of us are truly blessed by Justin's testimony. As we put our lives in God's hands, and as we go reaching for Him, as we tell people about His love, as we trust and depend on Him alone, let His name be glorified in us, to others, and the glory of God should be revealed to everyone. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to you at this time, we just want to ask that your, uh, the message that you placed on my heart, that it will be clear. There is nothing in this pastor, in this preacher here, that will become a stumbling block to, block to what you want to speak to us today. Lord, thank you for the privilege of speaking to your children, your people, And I ask that everything we do here today, even in this telephone, will only bring honor and glory to you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, the title of my presentation is Coronavirus, the End of an Era, question mark. I know that the following pictures that were taken with my own camera uh, are happening all over the world. For the first time, for the first time, it was one of the most prosperous countries in the world, here in Canada. You can see people lining up just to get the groceries, keeping the distance. Uh, the other day, driving in Victoria, I realized the streets are totally empty. I've never seen anything like that. Many people are asking questions, what is happening? Is this the end of an era? Is this the end of the world? What does the Bible have to say about this? And I have to be honest with you, I want to tell you something. For us here in Victoria, this is literally the end of an era. Because you see this church building that is completely empty. And, I, and I'm sure that you can see it on your screens. This is exactly what 983 Pandora, Victoria Seventh-day Seventh Adventist Church looks like this morning. With the exception of uh, our sound man and uh, our video crew, which is the Fry family, we want to thank them for volunteering and helping us in this live broadcast. We also have Ed Lambert broadcasting via Facebook. Um, so and we keep our distance. We want to be faithful. But folks, just take a look at this uh, image. This is probably the last time, the last time you will be seeing a, a live broadcast from Pandora, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Victoria. And this is the picture that I was able to take with my camera just a few days ago. We are saying goodbye to the church that served us for 70 years. Ever since 1947, this church building was here. And so for us here in Victoria, this is definitely the end of an era. And you will see also the connection to coronavirus. Please stay with us. 
because there is a connection, absolutely. It is very sad that, that on this last day, on this very last day that was scheduled from long ago, ever since uh, last year, we knew that this was going to be our last day right here, the very last Sabbath, here in March, the very last day in this building when we will have our worship. And it's very sad that on this very last day, the ending for Pandora is very humble. It's totally empty. But it's a very good reminder for each one of us to know that the church is more than a building. The church is not a building. The church is just a tool that God used and we used for His glory for the last 70 years. I want to just tell you a few more things about uh, this location in particular. You know, this church is located, the official address is 983 Pandora, but it is located at the intersection of Pandora and Vancouver. And here you see the picture of this intersection. What is interesting is that already back in July of 1889, folks, just listen to this, 1889, the first Seventh-day Adventist evangelist, H.W. Reed of East Portland and H.A. Baxter of Tacoma, they moved their tent meetings. And back then, those tent meetings were huge with hundreds and even sometimes thousands of people attending them to the corner of where? of Vancouver and Pandora. When I read this, I couldn't believe it. Even before this church was uh, constructed, this was the corner, this was the place. This was the place that God blessed even before this church was built as the very first message of the gospel with the Seventh-day Adventist evangelists. Believe it or not, as a matter of fact, uh, we made it to the, the headlines of Victoria Daily News. Victoria Daily Times, there was a newspaper, December 1889, it says, now remember, the evangelists came in July, and by the end of that year, the news article says that Adventists had purchased a lot at Spring Ridge, and I believe this is not too far away, just a few blocks away. Now, I may be wrong, but I looked at uh, Google Maps, and it says just a few blocks away, and they were about to build a church. Now, this was back in 1889, so those first evangelists here, series, were extremely successful to the point that within just a few months the first believers were ready to make their first purchase for the building of a church. Folks, we are saying goodbye to an era of God's blessings right here on Vancouver and Pandora. And on June 1890, just a year later, the first Adventist church in Western Canada was organized. Folks, the first Seventh-day Adventist church in Western Canada is right here. This is Victoria Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the third oldest church in all of Canada is, was organized right here in this place. We're saying goodbye to this property, and I would like to also make that connection to uh, what I believe is something very important. You see, Victoria Daily News. Now, uh, I'm gonna fast forward from 1890s to 1921, so 30 years later, just imagine, uh, the first believers and evangelists uh, came here in 1889, and then this is Victoria Daily, uh, Victoria Daily Times, Saturday, July 2nd, 1921. Just listen to the article that was written about the Seventh-day Adventist. This is what it says. What Seventh-day Adventists have accomplished? Stri striking progress by body now interested at Rest Haven. Those of you who are watching us from Rest Haven, I just want to say that more than ever, we're reminded of how close of a partner we are, Victoria and Rest Haven. We have a common history. We go back many years. And uh, here it says that the acquisition by the Seventh-day Adventists, who have a camp at Penticton, already by then we had a camp at Penticton, the acquisition of Rest Haven as a sanitarium similar to their institutions all over the continent will give interest to the following statement of their work. Folks, I'm not reading from the Christian newspaper, I'm reading from the secular newspaper that was published here in Victoria. And I'm gonna just read something more from that same article. Listen what Victoria Daily says. It says, Seventh-day Adventists are preeminently a missionary people carrying on a worldwide work. Few people have any true idea of the magnitude of the operations of this numerically small people. The present membership is close to 200,000 worldwide. And yet the small body of people contributed last year well over eight and a half million dollars. Folks, this is back in 1921. For the propagation of their teachings in the home and foreign lands. And like Martin Luther, I like this. 
I like when a secular newspaper says, like Martin Luther and his collaborators in the great Protestant Reformation, the Adventists are earnest believers in the educational value of the printed page. And at the present time, they have 45 publishing houses scattered throughout the world, printing religious literature in 96 different languages with an investment of over three and a half million. The total sales of all kinds of publications are advocating the principle stuff by the denomination amounted last year to over five and a half million dollars. Now this is an article right here in Victoria. Now why do you think I'm mentioning this to you? Because often I hear people who say to me, well back then it was so easy. Back then, and you know in some ways it is true, back then all the churches were packed because Canada was a Christian nation. Many people went to church uh, every weekend. And so some people may say, well it was easy for the early Adventists to preach the gospel. But I want to bring something interesting to your attention. I'm so glad for the records of the, of the Victoria Daily uh, newspaper. And I'm going to read an article now dating from 1918. So remember, this is the, what I just read to you was from 1921. The church is doing well. We're progressing. We purchased Resonate in Haven Sanitarium. And now, this is just a few years before this success. And I want to read something to you. Just please pay close attention and see if it sounds familiar. All right, so I'm going to read. This is November 1st, 1918. This is what it says. To the editor, are there still some citizens of Victoria who do not realize that there is a, an epidemic of influenza raging through the city? Judging from the crowd which gathered in government and view streets, Wednesday one might be led to believe that there are many who knew nothing of the epidemic. Or is it that they know of the epidemic? and yet are so selfish that they cannot forego the satisfying of their curiosity. And this is an article from a doctor. Then he says, has it not been stated over and over again that influenza is a crowd disease? Has the fact not been impressed upon them by the closing of, hello, somebody please read it carefully, what does it say? Has the fact not been impressed upon them by the closing of churches, schools, and theaters? And are they not aware that there is a very serious check to business, grave financial loss to many, and considerable loss of life through the continuance of the epidemic? Folks, today I have some sad news, but I have some good news for you. What you are experiencing right now, and you haven't heard this on the news, so that's why I believe this live broadcast will change your life, because guess what? If you read Victoria News a hundred years ago, our city, our country, our province has already gone through this before. I know many people panic saying, how can churches be closed? Folks, the Seventh-day Adventist churches were closed back in 1918 and 1920, but that did not stop the progress of the, of the gospel and the preaching of the gospel of the good news. Do not be worried, do not be discouraged. The same God that led us through the storm just over a hundred years ago in the same city right here is the same God that is going to deliver us even from here, from this coronavirus. What do you say to that? Amen. Folks, I believe that as I read the newspapers, they sound exactly like the newspapers of today. The theaters, the schools, the churches were closed. There's nothing new. I hope and I wish that CNN and BBC and the CTV would educate the public a little bit that in many ways we are not seeing anything new. Churches were closed before. Schools were closed before. There is no reason to panic because God is great and God is good. He's going to help us to pull us through. Read, read it a little bit further. I have another article here. Actually, the same article. November 1st says, In some other cities, much more stringent orders are made. Persons are not allowed to congregate even in groups of three or four. Only one is allowed to leave home at a time to go shopping masks Masks are worn in the street and everywhere, and stores are closed. Will it be necessary to go to these extremes in Victoria? It may. So you can see here in Victoria, Victoria City may have not gone, gone all the way to the extremes of other cities, but folks, this already happened. This, this, this similar epidemic that uh, swept around the world happened before. Uh, this doctor says, I would say to some citizens, wake up, realize that there is a war, a war in our very midst, an epidemic of influenza. Do not sneer at the enemy, do not belittle it by calling it simply a flu. Give it 
its full name, be serious and realize that the undertakers are busy. Remember the four rules which I published before ever a case appeared in Victoria. Do all you can to keep from getting the disease. If you do get it, <clears throat> if you do get it, go to bed. Send for a doctor. Do all you can to prevent the spread of the disease to others. Accomplish the first and last rules by avoiding crowding. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> so folks, there's nothing new. This is what is happening right now in our country is the same laws that have been implemented over 100 years ago. And if our great grandfathers were able to overcome this influenza by God's grace, do you not think that God, the same God that was, was able to move mountains, that he is not able to give us victory over coronavirus? I would like to say and suggest that we can beat this disease by prayer and by, by as, as the article says, by, uh, by following just the common sense rules. By washing your, uh, it says nostrils and throat. Well, there are some interesting ideas from a hundred years ago. With a weak solution of salt and warm water. Okay, so these are, feel free to, uh, uh, feel free to uh, research even more. All of these articles are online. But I just thought to bring it to your attention because I just <laughs> realized how literally uh, the things that were happening back then are happening even right now. Here are some pictures from the 1918. Uh, worldwide uh, epidemic of influenza. Please take a look. These are definitely disturbing images. And I want to bring some stats from the from 100 years ago. The statistics, uh, and you can research this, I have checked various sources. They say that more people died in the 18-month period of the influenza than died in all of World War I and World War II. Now, I just want you to think about these stats. That was uh, 100 years ago. What was the population of the world back then? Definitely maybe less than 2 billion. What's the population of the world today? And before you get scared, I just want to say to you that 1918 influenza death stats are between 50 to 100 million people passed away, died in this epidemic worldwide. World War, world War I casualties are about 20 million. World War II casualties are about 40 million. But influenza, the epidemic of 1918, where all the churches were closed, between 50 to 100 million, million people died. 675,000 deaths in the USA alone. This is 100 years ago. But here's something that I would like to encourage you. You know, back then there were no flu vaccines, no antiviral drugs, no antibiotics or mechanical ventilators. Treatment tools were basic and limited to supportive care and unproven remedies. So definitely, one would say that the world has learned more from this crisis 100 years ago. But well, one thing is clear, folks. If God helped us to survive this crisis back then, the same God is going to pull us through even this time. And I would be very careful. I know I've heard some preachers already online saying, well, God is punishing the world because the world is, uh, has rebelled against God. And some of what they say may be true, but I want to be very careful. Be very careful of what you say about who is punishing right now. Because I want you to, I want to read something from my favorite Christian writer. I want to, and Seventh-day Adventists know this book very well. The, the book is called Last Day Events. So if you have this book, if you have the copy, I would like to suggest that you read this book right now, especially Last Day Events. It was written by one of our Adventist pioneers a hundred years ago, more than a hundred years ago, page 242. Now listen carefully, I'm going to, I'm going to quote something that, that will help you go through this crisis. And think of where God is in all of this. All right, here it is. This is what she says. I was shown that the judgments of God would not come directly out from the Lord upon people, but in this way. When people place themselves beyond his protection, he warns, he corrects, he reproves, and points out the only path of safety. If they choose their own way, then he does not commission his angels to prevent Satan's decided attacks upon them. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress. Please mark these words. I agree with this Christian writer. It is Satan's power that is at work at sea and on land, bringing calamity and distress. And it is only by God's grace that the world was saved, literally saved a hundred years ago. And I believe the same God is going to save us even this through this pandemic here. Well, friends, Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 simply says this. This is the key verse. I want to thank Sister Ruby Lavasso. She mentioned this verse in our previous 
uh, online prayer meeting. She says, what about this verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? She says, this is what the Bible says, Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and restore their land. I want you to please pay close attention to the promise that God says. He will not only he uh, hear from heaven, He will forgive and restore our land. Now you may be saying, wait a minute, uh, what are you saying, uh, Pastor Fossil? Are you saying that we have something to confess? Uh, are you saying that we have to humble ourselves? Um, you know, I just would like to describe to you the world in the pre-influenza outbreak. See if there's any similarities. So right now, I am once again rewinding back to the pre-1918 year of the world. And I'm just going to read some, some statements from some of the news articles and just the historians and what they say about this about this particular uh, 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 century, uh, early 1900s. The stock market was booming. Wow, does that sound familiar? <laughs> I know many of us are worried about stock market, but let me tell you something. The stock market was booming. People were getting rich in the early 1900s. Industrial revolution, uh, automobile, uh, Ford started producing cars. Um, what about this one? People believed Listen to this. People believed that they were entering a millennium of peace. Unbelievable. People back then were starting to believe that they were entering a millennium of peace. And why, why do you think there was so much enthusiasm back then? Because they would say, through technology, we can conquer all the world's problems. And the most famous phrase the captain of the Titanic that was built in 1912, he said, God himself could not sink the ship. This is the true portrait of the early 1900s. Folks, do we have a similar problem of pride in 2020? Let me just remind you of some of the things that we heard on the news. And you know, I don't want to be political because somebody will probably label me and after this broadcast and say, well, probably you're the Republican or the Democrat or the liberal or conservative. But I have to say to you as a preacher of the gospel, I have never heard so much pride, even from world politicians in the last 10 years, I've, yeah. as I've never heard in my life, especially in the last 10 years. Our economy is good. We're the best. We're number one. We're the greatest. We're this and that. Where is your pride, humans? Where is your pride? You know what, believe it or not, but in this particular tragic moments like the coronavirus, it is a good wake up, uh, a wake up call to all humanity. A wake up call to realize that without God, we are nothing. Technology is not gonna save us. I remember the very proud communist teachers because I grew up in a communist country. They would tell us little kids, I was in grade one, my teacher would say, said, Marion, one day, our communist scientists will, will have technology to control the weather. You know, if the farmer needs a little rain, all they have to do is call the local scientist, the communist scientist. He will press the button on his computer and the rain will come. Only to realize that the Soviet Union was completely out of control. It's a disaster, natural disaster, even until now. Starting with Chernobyl, the disappearance of rivers, the cutting of the trees, complete natural disaster of the country that was so proud. Pride goes before destruction. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is a very timely verse for such a day like this. It says, But mark this, that there will be terrible times in the last days. And what do you think the Bible is going to say? The Bible is going to say, well, the economy is going to crash. Is the Bible going to say, well, what's, what's the definition of terrible in the Bible? Is the coronavirus the most terrible thing that humanity is facing right now? Or according to the Word of God, listen carefully, terrible times in the last days are described, are described in the following. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient, 
ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That is the greatest coronavirus that you can describe in the Bible, the spiritual coronavirus. That is the greatest tragedy of this of humanity, is the pride. Even God himself cannot sing this shit, really. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to just show you some pictures of, for the last 10 years, as I've said, I believe I've never heard as much pride coming from the television, coming from the newspapers. For the first time, even the Ku Klux Klan walked with no masks, shouting, we are the white race, we are number one, we are superior to everybody else, and this, this movement of neo-fascism has swept every country in the world, every country in the world, almost. I know I've been traveling even in Europe and other countries. There seems to be this national pride, whether it's Germany, whether it's Ukraine, whether it is Greece, whether it is Egypt, there's people that are full of pride. Even the word pride has gained a new positive twist in these last days. The pride parade, really? You know, I'm not, I'm not even going to go into all the details, but I want to say to you something. I believe that coronavirus is a good wake-up call for us to humble ourselves before God. And instead of saying we're number one, Philippians chapter two, verse three says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. This is the verse four for this crisis. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. When you go to the store, you know, stop hoarding. There's no, there's no reason to panic. I've heard people saying, well, no, you need to immediately, uh, you know, um, be ready. And, and there, is, there is wisdom to that, absolutely. But right now, at this time, when you go to the store, don't be selfish. If you were, if you were not prepared be, uh, prior to this, you know, don't be in a panic mode. As I said, this happened before. The schools were closed. The stores were closed. Don't be selfish. When you buy that roll of toilet paper, my goodness, you know, the greatest thing now is, is the toilet paper. <laughs> There's no toilet paper anywhere. Well, that's okay. Somebody mentioned this to me, and I said, that's okay. When we survived the nuclear disaster in Ukraine, we had no toilet paper. We used other things. Other things, newspaper, uh, leaves from the tree. A lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of good things. There's, the world is not going to end because of the toilet paper. Or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourself. I wonder what politician in the 21st century will ever say, you know what? We consider other countries even better than ourselves. It would be completely strange. But you know, I believe the world more than ever needs to learn to be humble in these last days. Days. Now, some of you may say, Pastor Mary, are you trying to say that Jesus is not coming soon? Well, that's not what I'm saying. But I do know that my Bible says that no one knows the day or the hour. So why even talk about it so much? We know that Jesus could have come even a hundred years ago. And many Adventists, many Adventists even today, we have many writings, even from our pioneers, who truly believe that Jesus was coming in their day. But that did not prevent them from planning, from, look, from looking forward um, into the future. Because even the Bible says when you plan something, you know, don't just, uh, uh, in the, especially in the time of crisis, just trust the Lord and then say, Lord, if this is your will, this will happen. If it's not your will, it's not going to happen. So each one of you should look not only to your own interests. So is this the end of, the, of an era? You know, I would hope so. I would hope that this is the end of an era of pride in particular. This is what the topic of today's sermon, coronavirus. Is this the end of an era? I believe that in moments like this, it is time to humble ourselves, whether you're rich or poor, especially back in 1900s. It's interesting like, how the articles were at first discussing that if they were blaming the poor people for the uh, outbreak of the, of the influenza. Uh, but later on, they realized that even the wealthy people whose houses are very clean, also contracted the disease. Sometimes a crisis like this teaches us that all of us are equal in God's eyes. Is this the end of an era? Well, I don't know. I do not know when Jesus will come, but you know, it could be that the end of an era for you and me could be tonight, because we do not know what tomorrow holds. So why worry about tomorrow? Let's think about our relationship with God today. I want to end uh, this presentation just with a brief story of another disaster in the making was back in August 
23rd, 2001, just a few weeks before the 9-11. And this is a very interesting story. I hope that this will encourage you because in August 23rd, uh, flight number 236 was destined to fly from Toronto to Portugal. And uh, everything was going well, but somewhere in the middle of the ocean, as you know, there's a big ocean between Portugal and Canada. The pilot noticed that the fuel gauges were, were showing him that he was running out of fuel. And uh, he, looked, uh, he looked at his uh, co-pilot, he said, this makes no sense. This makes no sense. We just filled our tanks with fuel. I saw it. We were filled to capacity. I'm sure it's a computer glitch. And today many people are saying the same thing. They will say, well, Jesus will never come. But folks, Jesus can come even tonight. And the Bible says that in the last days there, are some, there will be some people who will not even believe in the second coming. But what happened is that at 6.13 a.m., suddenly the right engine of this airplane flamed up. <laughs> now, just I want you to imagine, there was 300 passengers on this, on this airplane. 300 passengers. They were, at 6.26, just 13 minutes later, the left engine cuts out as well. Now, place yourself among these 300 passengers. And then they were still 1,500 kilometers away from Portugal. They were 11 kilometers above the ocean. This was tragic. But if you research this story, you will learn something interesting. There were some people on this flight who started praying to God for the first time in their life. There were people on this flight that for the first time were praying to God. These were their first prayers. Prayers asking God, help us. Help us. Somebody even said, Instead of screams, you could hear a pin drop and people whispering prayers, praying to God. I believe that their example is a good example to all of us. With 304 passengers and crew, the pilots did something unthinkable. For the first time in the, in the history of aviation, this airplane was able to glide. I don't, I don't, know, if you, I don't know if you knew this, but you know, uh, the modern, modern day airplanes, even the big jets with 300 passengers, they can glide with no engines um, for a long time. But they have to be very careful. They have to glide at a certain speed because if they were to glide at less than 290 kilometers an hour, they would plunge to the water like a stone. If they would accelerate by descending with more than 370 kilometers an hour, they would be unable to lower their landing gear. You're gonna say landing gear, what are you talking about? Well, you see the, the co-pilot suddenly noticed that it's a very tiny little island right in the middle of the, of the ocean. Um, this little island also happened to have just a little tiny airport. And so the pilots already were breaking uh, some uh, uh, Guinness uh, world records by flying for the longest. They were gliding for 18 minutes, folks. Can you imagine 18 minutes with 300 passengers in the crew? And the landing, well, let me just say this. This is a good ending to the story because the landing was rough. And the Bible says that this planet, in the very last days, the landing may be rough. Jesus even says, for there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. I would like to you and say to you that the Bible says that the landing and the final days of the earth will be easy. No, it's not easy. But, and Jesus says, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will even be shortened. So the landing will be rough. And folks, these are the pictures from the landing strip there in this little tiny island. Uh, 1,500 kilometers away from Portugal in the middle of the ocean. The airplane completely destroyed the runway. All the tires exploded. But for the first time in the history of this world, an airplane of this size was able to successfully land with no fatalities, 300 passengers and crew. Folks, why do you think it happened? Well, based on the, on the witnesses that were there, I believe that a good reminder for us, in moments like this, this is our opportunity to come to God. And maybe you saw, maybe in the last few years, and I'm speaking especially to some of our even church members, in the last few years, maybe, maybe you have been discouraged with God. Maybe that's the reason sometimes we didn't even see you here. Um, as a pastor here for five years, I look at the names of the, of the books in Victoria and I still see some names that I have never seen here in person in this church. Could it not be that this is the time for us to give our hearts to Christ? Is Christ the captain of your life? This is a good question for every businessman, 
for every doctor and nurse, for every politician, is Christ the captain of your life. Because the same Jesus tells us that he has won every battle. Even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus promises that he will still be there with us. We have nothing, there's nothing to be afraid of. But is Christ the captain of your life? Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Let us give our hearts to Christ. Somebody posted this on Facebook, and I share this on my Facebook as well, but I would like to encourage you with these words. I'd rather go through the storm with Jesus than sail through life without Him. May God bless you. Don't be discouraged. Make Jesus the captain of your life. And if there is somebody who is watching us right now, somebody who says, you know what? I really wanted to give my life to Christ. I really want to join a Bible study. Feel free to call us. You know, these days we can even have a virtual Bible study uh, in the privacy of your home. If you desire so, please email us. Visit our uh, Church in Victoria website um, and connect with us. And I would like to say, as I end this sermon in prayer, we have a special video clip to the memory of 983 Pandora. I hope that you will uh, watch this clip. And uh, I want to apologize that perhaps you know, we tried to bring as many pictures as possible to reflect the last few years of Pandora. Now, a few months ago, we, we, we already celebrated the closure of Pandora. We invited people from around Canada. And we already showed a video uh, a compilation of pictures from even as far as 50 years ago. But this compilation is of pictures for the last just five to seven years. Why? Because I, I believe that this is how Pandora will be remembered, with a, with a wonderful life that took place here, with a wonderful fellowship. And I would like you also to know that some pictures are going to be there for, for longer. Um, they're going to be shown for like two seconds. Some pictures will be uh, shown for only half a second. I hope you know that this was not intentional. This is a computer program that tried to put the pictures in sync with music. So this was not my doing, but this was the doing of the, of the computer. So I hope that, and I want to thank personally, Brother Ed Lombard. I just want to say to him that he has the greatest collection. He should be the historian, the historian of the Victoria Seventh-day Adventist Church. There's the most detailed collection of pictures of the Victoria Church on his Facebook website. So check out his website. There's so many more pictures that I wasn't able to include. But as we pray, I, I, we will conclude with this video compilation of pictures. I would just want to say and ask for, the, ask for God's blessing in your life. Dear Holy Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful reminder that you are the God who saved us and saved our country and the city of the influenza outbreak back in 1918. You are the same God who's going to save us even now. And Lord, if you want to come even today, we look forward to that. That's why we are called Seventh-day Adventists, because we believe that you're coming soon. Oh Lord, please come and help us to be connected to you more than ever before. I pray for all the nurses and doctors and everybody in, in this country and all around the world who are, who are sacrificing their safety to, to help others. But Lord, most importantly, I pray for peace. I pray for peace that passes all understanding. Oh Lord, we thank you for listening to us, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
a lot of <clears throat> that's a lot of memories just in that uh, that five years it's incredible. Just think of all those different events, all those different yeah. happenings, all those different singing, special music, Sabbath school. It's just, just incredible, really. Yeah, no, it's just yeah. you just can't compose the memory. I, I never think about it because you do it all the time and then you, you look back on it. Thank you, Eliza. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Ed. Yeah. All right. This is it. Well, to the new beginnings, guys. Yeah. Next yeah. chapter is Never the new church, right? Never look back to learn lessons, right? Well, unless Jesus comes. Jesus yeah. comes in the next few weeks, days, hours. So 100 million, well, okay, so the second world war is 